Hello, everyone. So I got given the, uh, the last talk of the, uh, this amazing day of talks. And uh, an even taller challenge is that I've been told to uh, make hypervisors interesting again. So I'm, I'm here to convince you at the end of a long day that there is something cool and fun happening in the land of hypervisors. So just to, uh, just to calibrate myself, how many of you have uh, done a deployment of, of Zen or VMware uh, recently? Great. OK, this is, this is the perfect audience. I think I can pull this off. Um, and how many of you use Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows? Oh, yeah. Wow, that's over 90% over of you. OK, this is definitely the right audience. So um, just to give you a better background, we started hacking um, uh, towards the start of the year on Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows. And uh, it kind of unearthed a whole bunch of interesting open source uh, components that we've uh, been releasing through the year as, as kits. So um, this talk is kind of giving a broader perspective on some of those uh, components, specifically the hypervisor-related components. So whenever you've deployed your conventional hypervisors, things like, um, like Zen, um, they tend to be built to run full guest operating systems. And so this means that um, they have a whole bunch of scaffolding in order to support and emulate legacy devices. So uh, infrastructure such as uh, PCI emulation, uh, network emulation, and until the guest operating system is para-virtualized, until it's augmented with the ability to directly interface with the hypervisor, um, you have to emulate very old hardware. And this old hardware um, is code that has to be built and, and run somewhere. And so conventional hypervisors have a lot of scaffolding to make sure they can run any operating system. Uh, in fact, uh, it's still possible in many uh, virtualization infrastructures to run 16-bit um, operating systems. And bootloaders, for example, are 16-bit. So there's a lot of legacy code um, just sitting there. And uh, the problem with this is that um, all of this requires coordination. And so traditionally, hypervisors have sit at the very bottom of the stack. They tend to wrap everything else. And it's difficult to use them uh, composably with the rest of your cluster, with the rest of your distributed system. Um, if you use something like Amazon, Zen is sitting at the, at the very bottom. And you can't um, flexibly grab the hardware resources, the, the VTD uh, extensions in the CPUs, and do anything interesting with them. So one of the big problems with this, apart from the lack of flexibility, is um, hypervisors are increasingly getting larger and larger with all of this, this code, and it's sitting right in the trusted computing base. So if you want a very lightweight, trusted hypervisor, uh, we're seeing just streams of um, exploits coming in. This is just uh, a sample from an uh, unfortunately long list um, from things like VGA emulation, uh, network emulation, and so on and so forth. So um, ideally, we'd want to figure out a way that we can use the, the core hardware resources uh, inside these hypervisors. Uh, and avoid the need for a huge amount of the, uh, the legacy stuff that has been uh, there purely because these things have to run um, uh, entire guest operating systems. What would it look like in a, in a world of containers and so on? So the key question I want to um, answer in the next, uh, in the next uh, few minutes is, uh, we're all building distributed systems, and uh, we have this awesome technology that we're seeing, uh, we've just seen today, in uh, pretty much all aspects of the stack, from networking to storage. Um, to uh, monitoring and to uh, orchestration. And how can all of these distributed systems use the primitives that the OS gives us, that the hardware gives us, uh, in much more flexible and container-native ways? So how can we map them into um, a lot of the infrastructure that uh, we want to use from a, from a DevOps perspective? So uh, to give you a recap, uh, a, a bit of a spoiler was in the title. Uh, we, we think that unikernels are quite a good way uh, to do this. What are unikernels? Um, hands up if you've heard of unikernels or seen a talk about them. So OK, that's about, it's about half the audience. So the recap uh, is about right. Um, the essence of unikernels, uh, we started off by figuring out if you take an operating system and you break it up into individual libraries, uh, including the kernel, things like TCP IP, device drivers, schedulers, the stuff that's uh, normally inside a kernel, um, and then you can take those libraries, and you can link them with a configuration file uh, and uh, a bootloader and form individual bootable elements. So for example, you could build uh, a small application that runs only on Zen as a, as a, as a specialized hypervisor. It discards uh, any of the libraries it no longer needs. Um, and the, the real ascendancy of, of this uh, architecture comes from the fact that with containers, we tend to build microservices. So uh, very specialized, single-purpose applications that you really want to uh, run as, um, as in, in as lightweight a fashion as possible. But the most important thing about unikernels um, is actually the library philosophy. So if you've seen from all the talks today, um, there's a huge amount of a number of kits being released, things like InfraKit uh, and um, uh, SwarmKit. And these are all uh, kits that have a library philosophy as well. The idea is you link them with your application, and then they will augment it with a certain amount of uh, functionality, but they don't impose policy on your application. The policy is, is from how you use the kit within your own distributed system. And so unikernels are the extreme version of this, where everything is a library, and you have to bring in your own policies uh, to this. Now, 
so unikernels uh, have been brewing for a number of years. There's been many, many decades of bespoke unikernels. Your, your Cisco rudders are, uh, as we saw in the Cilium talk, uh, the traditional vendor model for networking was a custom-built kernel that runs your router, and then you uh, are unable to modify or change it because it's been specialized for the purpose at hand. So the, the, uh, the thing we've been trying to do with unikernels is how do you democratize them? How do you get them out to every developer using Docker so that when you write a small fragment of code, um, it'll just get out there and be deployed, and you'll never even know you're using unikernels. You've just written your, uh, your source code, and the, the pipeline's taking care of it. The problem uh, that we've been uh, uh, facing is that a lot of the benefits are lost when you deploy on existing clouds, because they're running on big hypervisors that are uh, designed to run legacy operating systems. Uh, and so uh, when you're running the full operating system, you have to bring in the full uh, power of emulation. So what was previously a 10 millisecond boot becomes uh, a minute, for example, in Amazon, because it's doing a whole bunch of other management stuff. Um, and um, the, uh, if you're trying to make these things container native, it's difficult to manage hypervisor resources because they have a full stack uh, from within a container without giving your host full privileges. And this is something we're very resistant to. We don't want to uh, build a container system for unikernels that requires us to blow away the principle of least privilege. We saw from uh, the various talks in Tuff, from uh, Diogo's talk on, um, on the principle of least privilege, that we want to build an architecture that will let us um, use these VM resources, but without having to delegate a huge amount of power of the machine to, uh, to the, uh, the uh, management stack or, or indeed the, uh, the kernel running. So how do we fix this? Well, we can try to fix this by building a new set of hypervisors. And the hypervisors are ones that follow the philosophy of unikernels. So instead of uh, building a large thing that boots first in the machine and, and wraps everything, uh, we extend the kit model you've seen uh, 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 many examples of here today, and we break down the hypervisor itself into libraries. And we expose just the core functionality. The only things we expose are virtualizing CPU, uh, virtualizing memory, and virtualizing interrupts for, for uh, getting notification of external events. Everything else is out of scope. So we don't worry about device emulation. We don't worry about um, any kind of uh, uh, um, BIOSes and so on and so forth. All of those are optional bits of functionality. Just the core things that the hardware exposes um, are pulled into this, uh, this library. And then we, in a structured way, build up all of the other abstractions afterwards. The drawback is, um, well, if we're building a new hypervisor, where do we get this core functionality from? Uh, we'll have to install kernel modules and, and go through a whole bunch of, uh, a bunch of hoops, and it'll take uh, years and years to deploy. So as, uh, as Jana pointed out in the networking talk, there's all this cool set of functionality in, uh, in the latest Linux, uh, Cilium, for example, but Docker can't use it because it's not exposed in, uh, in all of the reasonable set of recent kernels. It's, it's highly frustrating, right? Because we want to deploy this stuff today. But then uh, in the pub in Cambridge, uh, we were slightly depressed about this because we wanted to use this cool technology. And it turns out if you take a closer look, it's not actually true. There's actually a lot of nascent support, and there's been a growing movement in open source to build these library hypervisors and to make them easily shippable today. And this was a surprise to us. It just kind of took us um, uh, a little bit uh, blindsided until uh, we started hacking on this stuff. So to give you a sense of the provenance for some of the technology in Docker for Mac, um, OS X has been shipping uh, since 10.10, uh, .10, so two releases now, uh, the hypervisor framework. Uh, hands up who'd heard of the hypervisor framework before installing Docker for Mac. So just, just a few people, uh, many of which are, are on the Docker for Mac team. So <laughs> let me say the audience had not heard of uh, the hypervisor framework in any meaningful way. Um, because it, it, had, it just wasn't really used in any mainstream applications. Apple had shipped it for their own reasons. Um, and meanwhile, FreeBSD had also built a hypervisor called Beehive, which is very similar to KVM. Uh, and FreeBSD is you know, it's a great OS. Uh, it's just not as popular as Linux. But Beehive is a fantastic, tight, uh, small, well-crafted um, hypervisor library built in a Type 2 style. So uh, an intrepid hacker called Miss64 on GitHub uh, took Beehive, and he ported it to use the hypervisor framework in X5. And he, he made this um, openly available. And then we came along and took that, and we, uh, we, we uh, tidied up the build process. And uh, you know, just to fix, fix a few bugs, 90% of the work was done by, by Miss64 and Xhive. We, we simply uh, created a maintained and, uh, and uh, shipping package, and we called it HyperKit. And this is something that can run guest operating systems in a library hypervisor style on a version of OS X without any kernel modules being required. And in Linux, the same thing had, had happened as well. So we have DevKVM which is the lower half of the KVM hypervisor um, exposed from the kernel. And a ton of interesting open source projects have sprung up uh, from Google, NoVM, uh, KVM tool as well, which doesn't require the full scaffolding of, um, of device emulation. This is used by uh, Intel, Intel Clear Containers, who, who I believe are here today. Someone from Intel is here. And um, uh, this is used as a lightweight mechanism for, for starting containers. And uh, UKVM is one I'll talk about. 
And so what I'm going to just uh, quickly run through in this talk is there's two shipping uh, products, one for the client and one for the server that both use these library hypervisors. And uh, they're as robust and, uh, and easily composable as, um, as the big conventional ones that you're used to. So we're entering a world now where uh, it's possible for uh, the average developer to start building hypervisor-based applications without having to uh, you know, rebuild a huge amount of the technology. We're, we're, we're seeing reusable uh, pieces here. So uh, pretty much all of you use Doc for Mac, so I'll talk about that very quickly. Um, uh, it, the idea was to get a native Mac application, so you should never know that you're using hypervisors or anything of that nature. And uh, it's sandboxable, running as your user, so it doesn't require admin privileges. And it's got native networking and file system support, so you should never know that uh, virtualization has been involved. Now, the way this works uh, was interesting. So we, we, we used a new Hypergate framework, and uh, we had to make sure that, for App Store reasons, that we are sa sandboxable. So you have to somehow take an entire distribution of Linux, virtualize it, run containers, and make sure that you uh, never escape a sandbox. You can never ask for root privileges on, on the machine. And the way this works uh, was a very straightforward architecture once the hypervisor framework became available. So we take the OSX kernel, and uh, we simply link against the hypervisor framework, just as you link against any other framework on your machine uh, um, uh, you know, uh, on OSX. And in user space, uh, we, uh, we open it up and we link to it. And um, all, of the, uh, all of the implementations that normally go into a kernel, things like threading and uh, trapping on um, IO and dealing with MMIO and managing ACPI and PCI, is all built as a library. And this looks very much like Node.js, except in C instead of uh, JavaScript, where you're just dealing with callbacks, and you have a single threaded process. And anytime something happens that's interesting, you get a callback, and you just handle it. So you can just start building up libraries of uh, emulation uh, in this space. And then uh, eventually, after, after a few weeks of hacking, we ended up with uh, a Linux kernel running in there, because uh, we had just enough emulation to boot Linux kernel with uh, special drivers in there. And then uh, we took a very embeddable uh, user space known as Alpine Linux. And uh, we obviously configured the very latest Docker. Um, and we redirected all of its state back to OS X, so that uh, this thing is just running as a process, is stateless, and everything it needs is coming from its host. So in one process, you can now run Linux and, uh, and virtualize it uh, quite nicely. So uh, the embedded Linux was, uh, was actually really straightforward. It required very little uh, uh, modification. It's just a matter of crafting an existing distribution such as Alpine and making sure that um, all of its state, it's already a stateless distribution, was, was redirected back to OS X. And I think uh, Justin Cormack, who's the primary maintainer of Alpine, we've had a few questions about it, is here somewhere. Uh, he's waving his hand. But uh, we'll, he'll be definitely be here tomorrow. So the hypergate library structure um, is actually really, really straightforward. So if you, if you look at GitHub, it's in docker slash hypergate. I thought I'd, I'd show you really quickly what it looks like. So um, if I, this is um, hypergate. Uh, this is just cloned from Docker. Oh, no, I'm not married. Disaster. It's, it's that lightweight. It's amazing. Uh, let me, uh, how do I do this? Ah, there we go. Excellent. All right, now I can't see it. OK, I'm going to look here. So. Um, ILS is just a, a normal uh, a directory. I can just make minus j10. And um, that's my hypervisor built. So it's just a bunch of independent files. Um, each of these are optional little files that um, uh, represent IO protocols. They're all uh, libraries. And when I um, look at the, the, the stripped binary, um, it is 240 kilobytes in size, so it's about 253k. So that is a full hypervisor built in, in no time at all. So HyperKit is incredibly lightweight. <laughs> And by the way, full credit to Miss64, who is the genius hacker behind this. So all we did was really uh, you know, package this up for use. So he, he, he uh, forked a BSD library, put it up uh, live, and uh, just made it available to us for free. So we're, we're massively uh, appreciative to him for doing that. So um, if an app doesn't need something, it's just not linking to it. And uh, we have this lightweight mechanism. Uh, but then the fun began, because we had to do networking. And the problem with networking is uh, it just never works in laptops. Uh, many of you work for enterprises. You have corporate laptops. And we just wanted to make the whole thing invisible. So when you do networking conventionally in uh, you know, VMware or in, uh, in Fusion, for example, or in uh, VirtualBox, we're in, we're in user space. And uh, of course, the entire point is running containers, 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 containers. And um, those tend to be virtualized. And they come in from the embedded Linux as Ethernet frames. But when they come in as Ethernet frames, um, the next step you have to do is how do you get those out of your Mac to the outside world, or your Windows machine to the outside world? And what we do is normally you install a kernel module that acts as a bridge, because unfortunately OS X does not have bridging support built in. And then you have to then go into the nightmare of shipping kernel modules and keeping them up to date and you know, et cetera. You're just stuck in a, in a bit of a support uh, mess. 
So what we wanted to do specifically was to figure out how do we take all of this stuff and uh, make it so we didn't have a kernel module, but also continue to work with all of the, the corporate uh, VPNs, for example, so all of the hooks into your Mac or your Windows machine that are very, very commonplace, uh, and also expose services so you don't see a separate IP address. You, you just see localhost in your Mac, even though you're virtualizing everything. Uh, and the answer there was uh, the unikernel uh, philosophy. So instead of, remember that Hypercade is a library. So we can just uh, take the networking stack, and we can just override the callbacks for networking. And instead of bridging them, we can just do whatever we want. We can just write functions that uh, represent our Docker for Mac application and continue. And that's exactly what we did. So another kit called VPN kit, um, uh, which is open source as well in Docker, uh, takes, does something a little bit crazy, admittedly. What, what it does is that it does the opposite of deep packet inspection. Uh, we took from Mirage OS a, a, a unikernel written in OCaml. Uh, we took the, uh, the TCP IP stack, which normally, takes Ethernet uh, which normally takes socket calls and emits Ethernet frames, and we inverted it. So we said, well, could you give us Ethernet and then reconstruct TCP state so that you'll reconstruct from all of the, the partial orders of Ethernet that you get a bunch of TCP flows and DNS? And can you translate those into socket calls for us so that um, whenever this application finishes running, it's just making OSX socket calls? So this unikernel was a library intended for another purpose, and we just took the libraries off the shelf, we munged them around a little bit, and we linked them into our hypervisor. And we, have, we now have a hypervisor that um, uh, can take Ethernet flows, and instead of requiring bridging, just uses normal OSX kernel sockets to send traffic to the outside world, thereby solving all the problems that you have from firewalls and antivirus software and so on, because to the outside world, it looks exactly like a normal OSX app that is just making socket calls. All of the virtualization has been hidden by using these kind of translation layers. And this is what um, uh, like, you know, one of the early benefits of, of Unikernels were for us was the ability to take these off-the-shelf system libraries, uh, mess around with them, and just link them uh, into an app that would just work. And uh, since then, uh, we, we made this live uh, a little bit cautiously, obviously, in, in one of our early betas. And it's now the, uh, the predominant way that uh, traffic is, is sent in Docker for Mac. So um, the idea here is that these, these unikernels um, use Hypercade just to wrap up the Docker for Mac story. Um, they use Hypercade to virtualize for a domain-specific purpose. But the kit itself is just available. It's open source. So if at any point you're building an application that, that needs some kind of uh, uh, some, uh, virtualization and isolation for some reason, Hypercade is available for you to use. Um, and we can link various unikernel libraries very easily, just like a normal application. So um, it's just like linking SSL. You link in uh, low-level TCP IP stacks. And Docker for Mac internally is quite a complex distributed system. It does a ton of, obviously, bring up and stuff so that it boots within a second. Uh, it's got to boot all of these different components, but this is hopefully hidden from the user. But you, you've all been very kind of giving us bug reports. So uh, it, it'll definitely be more hidden from the user in, 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 in soon, but it's, it's doing a pretty good job. So I just wanted to uh, wrap up the Docker for Mac story and continue uh, the unikernel story. So that, that was, uh, it uh, did take up a lot of time for our team for a while, but you know, we're obviously very proud of shipping Docker for Mac, and uh, it's really strengthened unikernels because we've learned a lot about how to build these libraries and how to structure them and so on. Uh, and the end result of this is that unikernels themselves have been, have been gathering pace uh, in, the, in the open source community. And the challenge, though, is uh, that everyone is running into is how do we make them easily deployable? And the obvious answer to that is how do we make them container native? Because once these unikernels are container native, we can just leverage the entire ecosystem that we've seen today. The, the storage, the networking, the orchestration. And instead of orchestrating a uh, Linux machine, remember that Docker is now OS agnostic. Uh, you can do Linux, Windows, and unikernels all under the same umbrella. Uh, and we've seen several mentions of where unikernels could fit into several of the components that we've seen. So uh, uh, Thomas uh, Graf mentioned in Cilium that it's a very unikernel-like architecture, uh, in Swarm for secrets management, also very unikernel-like, it's very specialized. So you can, you can see exactly where this technology will start to fit in. And so uh, Mirage OS 3 is, is beginning by uh, shipping a new library hypervisor that we've been working with uh, very closely with IBM and uh, the University of Cambridge to, uh, to, to make happen. So it's called Solo 5. And whenever you build a Mirage unikernel like this, uh, it runs as a Unix process. And the unikernel just opens up dev KVM as, um, uh, and gets hardware isolation. So instead of it, it being an ELF binary, you run it just like a normal binary. It opens up a device, which uh, you know, can be given uh, and ascribed the normal uh, Linux uh, capabilities. 
and it then proceeds to become a unikernel. It just virtualizes itself. Uh, it uh, uh, grabs the, uh, the hardware protection. It becomes a small virtual machine, and it uses whatever resources it had whenever it, uh, it entered that mode. For example, uh, uh, a tap-based networking interface, and it just runs. And UKVM is insane. So this is the lightweight uh, monitor developed by Dan Williams and, uh, and Ricardo at, uh, at IBM. And it's about 10 kilobytes in size. So you saw uh, Hypercat, you know, it's a 200 kilobyte binary. The, the library itself is smaller. But uh, 10K is, is, is pretty darn impressive. And they have a hot cloud paper at Usenix this year about exactly how that worked. And it runs privilege separated as well. So it fits in beautifully into the Unix philosophy of just using fork and capabilities, or depending on which Unix variant you're on, um, OpenBSD, for example, you can pledge. Um, and one process r opens DevKVM and then uh, gets all the resources it needs, and then the other one um, executes the kernel. And the boot times are the same as processes. You just, um, you, you, you just have another layer of protection from uh, the hardware isolation. And of course, you can run without hardware isolation for development purposes or if you just don't want to, uh, for example, on embedded ARM devices, and uh, everything will just uh, uh, work mostly the same. To give you, uh, to give you some numbers and uh, what it looks like, the uh, the the, uh, the trusted computing base. Uh, where did that? Uh, here we go. The trusted computing base is pretty small. Um, let's see. Don't look at it. All right. Got it. Is that right? Uh, top. top. All right. That doesn't turn. Okay. Perfect. So uh, here we have QMU, and we have three different hypervisors. We have QMU. We have a lightweight um, hypervisor, which is uh, which is what uh, a KVM tool, for example, uses, and this is UKVM. So you can see here that the the lines of code are smaller already. So QMU is about 25 kilobytes of um, uh, 25,000 lines of security critical code. This is uh, just, uh, just shy of 1,000. And I think with a bit of, um, bit of munging, it'll, uh, it'll get smaller. So this is uh, almost 20 times smaller than, uh, than QMU. And uh, the Solo 5 kernel itself is also, uh, is also simpler as well. And things like Malik and stuff are obviously uh, very well-reviewed libraries. And boot times are also reflected here, because uh, UKVM runs uh, basic things much, much faster than QMU. But there's a big uh, jump in the graph here of uh, 600 milliseconds. So we're getting close to a, th uh, a second here. And this is just starting up at normal process fork times for things like uh, block devices, uh, static web serving, and, and, and hello worlds. And there's full details um, in uh, Dan and uh, Ricardo's uh, hot cloud paper from this year's uh, uh, Usenix um, hot cloud uh, workshop. So Marjo S3 has had a lot of work here to, to, make, this, to make this possible. Uh, it's, it's, it's had a bit of a surge of use because uh, we're using many of its libraries in Docs for Mac, so there's been a lot of bug fixing there. But also, this represents the first time that Mirage OS has had multiple backends for multiple hypervisors. So it supports Zen, it supports KVM, it supports Unix. Uh, there's even uh, someone working on, at Facebook working on a, on a JavaScript compilation backend for React. Uh, I'm not sure what to make of that, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of far away from my normal domain. But um, you know, JavaScript's good. Uh, and um, this is intended. In the kit philosophy, so Mirage OS has its own set of users. But the crucial thing, the, the, the growth that we expect to see in the next year, and, and we hope to work with the community on, um, is that this is a template for other projects, other unicorn projects, other languages, to share the same kind of hypervisor libraries, things like HyperKit, uh, UKVM, uh, and, then, and then form this kind of base of, of liberally licensed libraries that will, will form the standard for how we can deploy unikernels in, in, in container native code. And uh, just to make sure this happens, we, uh, we're all around uh, tomorrow. So we have, a, we have a buff. How many people here are unikernel hackers, would you say? OK, so we, ha oh, this is great. So we have, we have around uh, 20 people by my counting already today. And many of the, uh, the Docker team and, and the Cambridge team are here as well. So we're all going to be close to somewhere um, hacking this stuff and making sure that it works. But just to convince you that it works, uh, my colleague Martin, who uh, did the bulk of uh, integration for Solar 5, is going to come and just give us a quick demonstration of how it fits, fits together. Can you hand me the video? Uh, sure. Is that big enough? It'll have to do. <laughs> um, oh, hang on. <laughs> oh, I see what it's. Okay. 
So I'm, going, I'm just going to do a very short demo of um, the Mirage 3 targets. Um, and specifically, I want to highlight the lightweightness of UKVM versus the classic KVM QMU. Um, how, how many people here are familiar with KVM QMU and have used it? OK, pretty good. So. Here's a classic. Um, this, so this is this is Mirage 3 basically running, um, targeted to run on a classic Vertio hypervisor. So we're calling the target Vertio, but I've just run it as you can see using standard QMU KVM, um, and just to show that this is doing something. There we go. <laughs> right, it displays a whale. Okay, nice, nice, but. Hey, it's still just QMU. So, to give you an idea, here I have the same, the, the, the identical unikernel compiled up with the UKVM target, and just to give you an idea of the size difference of the hypervisor part, so QMU on this particular box, standard Debian build of QMU, is something like 8 megs of binary. Um, and the UKVM binary, that we're going to run. Right. Same thing. Same unikernel, same code, um, with just lower layer swapped out for the UK VM interface. There we go. Oh, and it's serving Wales. And so to leave you with a slightly experimental or um, version of this, we can actually run this in a Docker container with the hypervisor part running in a container, which I will do here when I find the command. And if you all now go to, for those of you whose Wi-Fi is working, go to this site. You will get a whale. <laughs> and this is running as a fairly straightforward Docker container. And I can also, the other interesting thing to show here is. Oh, it tackle. Ah. No, I can't actually see that part of the it's screen uh, on here. So. Back, back one. And it, yep, that's right. So this is what the image looks like. There's there are exactly three layers, one of which is the unikernel runner shim that we're using for this demo. Um, the other one is the UKVM binary, which is 1.2 megs because it's a static, unstripped binary. Um, and the rest is the unikernel. This can all be stripped down. This is just the current debugging development build. Um, yeah, and that's what's running this. And if you're interested, then um, come to the BOF tomorrow. So I'll just wrap up quickly. I just wanted to, ooh, there we go. Let's not drop my laptop. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's fine, actually. Is, is this going to come Awesome. Wow, the switch actually worked. So I just wanted to go back to this question of how can distributed systems use hardware protection more flexibly and composably? So the, uh, the really important part of, of Martin's talk was just how, how normal that was, right? It was just Unix binaries being compiled and run uh, in, uh, without any, any drama. So the, 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 the dockerizing now has is, is been narrowed down from uh, managing whole kind of virtual machine infrastructures to the issue of um, how do we make sure we can plumb through in a portable way uh, portions of the, the Docker uh, uh, compute API. So things like uh, whenever a Docker container gets networking, how can we make sure we can pass that through in as an efficient way as possible to the, to the stack? If we're using distributed storage, how can we plumb that through so that the, the typically distributed storage is network-based, so we just need a, a file system endpoint into the, into the unikernel and establish standards for those um, so that all of the unikernel implementations have one common library by which they can discover these. So, but in the meanwhile, we're still exploring um, this entire other dimension, which is hardware protection. 
So it turns out that there's more than just one level of hardware protection. There's um, within the, the VT extensions in, in, in x86 and within ARM, there's whole universes of, of new advanced functionalities being put in there. So our hope is that by, by, uh, by letting people do this, you can help us uh, with use cases for, for example, things like Intel SGX and some of the, the latest kind of trust zone technologies for ARM. We can figure out exactly how we can take a, a nice developer experience, make it really easy to, to use some of these, uh, these advanced bits of functionalities that have so far been locked away in hypervisors, where um, the hypervisor is doing the core useful thing, but it's not necessarily taking advantage of some of the, the more advanced hardware functionality. So that's really the purpose of this hackathon tomorrow. We, we could all sit together and um, unicorn friends could hack, but if uh, any of you who are currently interested in or building distributed systems wants to come along, uh, we would love to get away from our, 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 our group and talk to you about your use cases and uh, maybe hack some code. So for example, one of the really cool ideas that came up today was um, uh, we, w we could take the Mirage virtual Ethernet interface and build a very large-scale simulator based on, uh, based on virtualizing time and uh, Ethernet that, uh, that Magnus uh, from Mirage has been working on and, uh, and use that to help test SwarmKit so that instead of uh, you know, spinning up 20,000 machines, what if we just ran a massive process that would just simulate the Ethernet and feed it to SwarmKit to, to give it a sense of failure? So we've just been brainstorming these ideas and trying to figure out how do we take this massive system libraries that's growing and put them together with, uh, with interesting, interesting, uh, uh, interesting pieces. And um, uh, for example, I, I noticed um, Alfred from Includos is here. That's a unicorn written in C++. So that makes it increasingly easy to, to blend together um, across kind of systems libraries such as C with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the more of the unicorn world. So uh, I, we think it'll be an exciting buff tomorrow, but it'll be, uh, it'll be incredible if uh, you show up and, and help us hack in it. And meanwhile, uh, feel free to fork uh, pull request, merge, and issue all of these repositories here. So thank you very much for being such a good audience at the last talk of the day of uh, a great day of talks.